suicide prevention and mental health reform. And um, today's session is brought to you by a project called the Place-Based Suicide Prevention Trial Project, uh, which I'm leading. The, it was, uh, for the last couple of years, it was led by Brooke Carlesso, who some of you may, may know, and Brooke's gone on maternity leave. So I've taken the reins from now on. And the project is uh, continuing for the next two years and moving into a sustainability phase. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it covers the areas of Bass Coast and South Gippsland uh, with the uh, whole of Gippsland approach, something that we're uh, working towards. I also like to mention, uh, if you came a little bit early, you would have seen these slides that were scrolling through. And one of those slides was about a, an online module called QPR. So on, QPR is a self-paced online learning module. And it is, um, it is, uh, it is uh, focused for the community to learn, community and service providers with no previous training in suicide prevention, uh, to learn how to respond and appropriately and support someone who may be in a crisis and having suicidal thoughts. So it's a really great module for anyone to do. It only takes 90 minutes. You can stop and start it at any time. You can do it at your own pace. And Gippsland PHN, are offering anyone living in Gippsland at the moment uh, a free license to complete QPR online. So if you're interested at all in that, uh, pop down to the PHN website and search for QPR and it'll give you more information and the access code and the link. Okay, a little bit more about today. Uh, obviously, everyone's muted when they pop in. I'd like you to, to please stay on mute while Louise is uh, presenting today. However, feel free to send me a chat or make comments in the chat box. Uh, I'll be responding to as many of them as I can. Um, also, if there's something that I can't respond to or that's more relevant to what Louise is speaking about, I'll interrupt her and we'll, we'll ask Louise to address those questions as they come up. Today's being recorded and uh, you'll all get a copy of the recording and the documents sent out with the uh, evaluation survey after the, the event. And there'll also be a certificate of attendance sent out to you as well. So just a brief overview of one of the uh, core functions of Gippsland PHN for the, um, for the health service community, and that is a, our Health Pathways Gippsland website. We have a fantastic Health Pathways team that work towards um, putting the best and the latest information on this uh, Health Pathways Gippsland website, which includes information about um, uh, mental health, physical health and wellbeing, uh, as well as referral pathways, which are kept up to date and um, GP editors are involved in this work and it's a fantastic site. We've recently included areas on the site um, around suicide risk and suicide support services and um, those services including other mental health services will be, will be um, more developed more into the near future. So it's my pleasure to introduce you to our presenter today. Um, some of you, or if not all of you, may have met Louise last week. Dr. Louise Flynn has been a psychologist for over 25 years. She has worked for many, many years with people who have been bereaved by suicide. Uh, for the past 15 years, uh, Louise has been the manager of support after suicide. And um, that is a service that is available to all people in Gippsland as well as Melbourne, even though they're Melbourne based. Uh, there's been a transition to phone and telehealth um, counselling, which a lot of Gippslanders have been taking up more recently. So her day-to-day -day work involves counselling, group facilitation, uh, as well as admin for support after suicide. Um, Louise is also a fantastic contributor to the, to the project that we're running locally, the PHN's uh, Place-Based Suicide Prevention Project in Bass Coast and Latrobe. And, We've been working together for a couple of years, um, Louise and I, and it's always a pleasure. So thank you for listening to my little spiel and I'll hand you over now 
to Louise Flynn for the rest of the presentation. And as I said, um, there will be opportunity to chat during the talk, but also there'll be a discussion at the end as well. So I think today is going to be really interesting uh, with lots of a lot more interaction than last time. So here we go. Thank you, Louise. Great, thanks, Helen. Yeah, so <clears throat> um, today, uh, last last uh, uh, time was kind of laying the foundations and some of the theoretical foundations, the body of knowledge in a sense, that's really helpful for doing this, uh, this work with people who are bereaved. And what we're gonna focus on today is very much more kind of in depth um, and supporting people, particularly um, relevant in a counselling role. Um, I also think it's got it's got wider application than that, but definitely um, applicable to a counselling role. So I will share my screen. So it will be a PowerPoint presentation again, but there'll be um, hopefully you'll have some questions or points of clarification, and very happy to have conversations with you about things. So I will share my screen, and we'll head to the. PowerPoint. Here we go. So, so what I'm going to do today is um, guiding principles might be a bit too fancy a term, but just have a look at some of the, um, I guess, starting points that are helpful, looking at um, uh, in depth at some uh, issues and experiences that will arise. Uh, we'll take a closer look at responding to guilt and blame. And I'll touch uh, for a little while on uh, talking with children and young people. It's a question uh, we get asked a lot about is, is it okay to tell children? And if so, how do I do that? So um, I just thought it I would make time for it um, today. Uh, yeah, often people, um, what people need most is a bit of confidence actually in talking about uh, this area. So just a little reminder that this is um, a slide that I did show last time, but when we're talking about suicide bereavement, we're talking about loss and grief and quite profound and intense loss and grief, trauma. We're talking about the unique issues and experiences that come with suicide. And we're also talking about a social experience as well. So there's an experience for many people, not everybody, but of stigma, uh, which can be very isolating. Um, and the other thing I thought I'd mention today um, just to add to this is um, what we might think of as uh, suicide as actually being a preventable death. So, so sometimes I think there can be a bit of an idea around that somehow suicide is inevitable, like you can't stop someone from taking their own life. And there's certainly uh, instances where that's uh, probably true. But increasingly, uh, people in mental health, the coroner, for instance, are seeing suicide as a preventable death. And that, that's um, at a systems level. Um, and I think it affects people quite personally too when they're bereaved. At a systems level, what, what I'm talking about here is how um, in some cases people have had interaction with say the mental health system before they took their own life. And I guess what I'm focused on is what effect that has on the bereaved. Um, sometimes bereaved people, um, and for good reason, don't feel that the, uh, what they, uh, the support that they received from the system was, was adequate. And, and what I'm getting at there is that when a bereaved person, and I've seen this myself, the difference between when someone knows that the best, that everything was done that could have been done to, to uh, prevent this person taking their own life, that's a very different experience when someone has the feeling that actually the person was let down in some way. 
So just again, it's just acknowledging that the the impact that that can have. And also, I think it's also um, can be quite a uh, a source of agony. I think for people when they just think, um, if I'd been there, this wouldn't have happened. So it's kind of hard to put into words, but it's a bit like that in a sense, that moment when that person decided to do this and then took the action to end their own life, if they'd been there, this death would not have happened. Now, I know we can, we can argue with that logically and it's important for people to move beyond that, but I'm just, I guess, saying that it is particularly agonising, I think, uh, for people and can be quite a source of preoccupation, which is just um, very painful and so needs to be worked with. And some of, uh, some of the things I'm going to talk about today will, will do that. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to add that um, sense really that as a preventable death in many instances, um, that does, I think, add to the, to the, um, the burden of grief and loss, I think. And again, I'll just reiterate that the reason why um, we uh, need to provide care and support uh, to people after someone they love has taken their own life is that there is research that says there's an increased risk of mental health issues, anxiety, depression, PTSD. Uh, exposure to suicide does mean that some people will have an increase or even for the first time have suicidal thoughts and suicide attempts. And the other thing, um, the other experience is that people can withdraw from employment, social engagement. So their community participation can really um, reduce. And these are these are the things that we're um, in our support for people. We're, we're um, trying to ensure that these things don't, don't happen. In terms of supports, um, some of the, the research and literature demonstrates that counselling that does address uh, those issues is helpful, and that can be with an individual, a couple, or a family. That can be very helpful. Support groups are incredibly important. Um, being in a room, sharing experiences with other people bereaved by suicide is incredibly powerful. Now, support groups aren't for everybody. Some people actually don't benefit from them and don't like them. But for those who do, uh, they're incredibly helpful. And when I've got homogenous groups there, that's in a sense acknowledging that most of the time people will be better off in a support group with other people bereaved by suicide. Uh, being in a grief group... Um, with people who've lost someone by other, um, other modes of death can be actually unhelpful to people bereaved by suicide. So what we've learned is that being in um, a homogenous group with other people bereaved by suicide tends to be uh, um, more helpful. And psychoeducation, and that uh, can come through in counselling and group work where people, um, you're providing uh, good information about grief, trauma, suicide and the impact. Um, so normalising people's experience can be a really important part of this work because people feel so, uh, uh, their experience is so extreme and so unfamiliar to them. They will be experiencing themselves in ways that they're just not accustomed to. So it can be quite frightening. So to let people know um, that this is, unfortunately, the way it is for most people who've lost someone significant. So that psychoeducation can be incredibly helpful. So giving people information on grief, trauma um, can be very helpful. And just another starting point is, I guess, um, is, is knowing or what our expectations are or, or knowing that actually sometimes our ideas and expectations can actually get in the way of us providing good support. 
So it is very helpful to have a sense um, as much as we can sometimes of our own beliefs and attitudes about suicide. Um, and sometimes you can find them popping up even when you didn't know you held them. Um, so, uh, for instance, sometimes, you know, when we're seeing the intense pain that someone's in, it can be easy to be judgmental about the person who's died, um, to think of them as selfish or how could they do this to this person. And um, that's, that's actually quite a, um, mostly that's a really unhelpful thing to do. Uh, a lot of people around any bereaved person will be thinking those things and they won't find it helpful. Um, being judgmental about the person who died, being angry with the person who died on the part of someone who's supporting a person actually won't help. Um, I think also there can be an expectation that someone who's bereaved by suicide will be angry with the person who died and that's actually not, um, sometimes that's certainly true, but a lot of times that isn't. Um, people don't feel angry with the person. They feel pained. They feel sad. Um, they feel a whole lot of things. But anger with the person who died isn't, um, isn't always part of the experience. So, again, good to be aware of that in terms of our expectations. I think also... Um, we've often had our own experience of grief um, and we can have an idea, there's kind of cultural and societal ideas about grief, what it looks like and how long it lasts. And I probably did touch on this last time. Um, and what you'll find is that anyone who's bereaved by suicide will exceed all those, um, all those expectations. And certainly there's other deaths where that's the case as well, any, any death that's traumatic. So the duration, how long it lasts, and the intensity of it is, is just profound. So, and what we've, and certainly there's other literature, and what we've learned in our experience of working with people is that uh, for some people, you're looking at between three and five years sometimes before people can really have a sense of their, their um, grief symptoms subsiding, when they feel like they can get a perspective, that sort of when they feel like they're finding their feet again and, and can sort of uh, have their heads above water, um, and when they've got a sense of what we sometimes call a new normal. For some people, you are looking at two, three, five years before that happens. Now, their experience isn't going to be the same that whole time. People will move in and out of it. But before people feel sort of, in a sense, really that they've got perspective on this, they're really um, able to kind of bear the grief, you can be looking at years for some people. So it's really good to have quite... Um, uh, realistic expectations because what can happen is that you can start um, thinking or oh, they're stuck or isn't it about time they started moving on and whenever you start feeling like that it's good to just think okay what's going on here um, maybe I need to rethink something about the way I'm being with this person um, so I think that's that's just a good um, helpful starting point and um, I guess because of the extreme nature of it and the duration of it, it is um, uh, it is easy to pathologise people's experience and to see it as problematic. Now, it can be problematic for the person because it's so such a level of suffering, uh, but actually it's in the realm of normal for this experience. And also just to be aware as a starting point that assessment for uh, suicidality and anxiety, PTSD, all those things that just need to be in your mind um, when you're with people. And people may need um, specific assistance with some of those particular issues. Uh, yeah. I hope it's okay to say all that. I'll get on a little bandwagon every now and again about all sorts of things. So um, probably, you know, knew all those things but it's good to have them confirmed I think sometimes and just another thing is kind of like the the counsellor role 
um, I think can be a little bit different when you're talking with people who are um, really traumatically bereaved. Um, there's a group of uh, grief um, kind of, I guess, people who theorise about grief who've called the council a role, expert companion. And there's a sense of that, you know, there's a body of knowledge, there's experience, there's qualifications, which mean that there's some knowledge that we have. But the sense is that sometimes what's needed by people is that sense of walking with people who are bereaved, walking beside. So that's where that companion comes in. Yes, we're, we're professionals, we need to maintain that, but there's a sense of, I think that for most people um, who we're in contact with, this experience will be the very worst thing um, that they're going to experience, experience, that they have experienced and will experience in their life. So I think that it's a privilege and also a responsibility in a sense uh, when we're with people. And I think that idea of being a professional and in a sense, I don't like claiming the term expert, but it's got that sense of knowledge and qualifications as well as a sense of walking with people. So I think it's a slightly different um, idea about uh, counselling than we might be used to. And I think there's another writer who called it being a safe harbour. And I think the world that some bereaved people are in when this happens is so frightening and feels so out of control. To have a space with a person where they feel safe is um, incredibly important and very valuable. So that, that safe harbour, a lot of things can go on in that safe harbour. So it is about facilitating the process of understanding what's happened as best we can and a sense of integrating this into someone's uh, sense of their self and their life and a kind of, I guess, in a sense, reconstructing a sense of self, a sense of life and relationships. So that's definitely what can occur in this space uh, that's provided. And it's also about focusing on really all aspects of the relationship with the person who died, really quite in-depth exploration of that relationship, what it meant. The events of the suicide need to be revisited and the aftermath in terms of uh, psychological and I can't blank on what that bit is, um, and social, the psychological and social impact. So. I think when I'm talking about exploring all aspects of the relationship with the person, sometimes that can take quite a long time because there might be aspects of the relationship that people feel um, reluctant to talk about. They might have shame um, about an argument that was had or all sorts of things that people can feel um, yeah, reluctant, hesitant, will be concerned about being judged. So it's um, uh, something that might take quite some time. But these are the important things, really important things that are very helpful to a person when they're kind of feeling like um, everything's uh, sort of rubble on the ground, entering into a space where they can do these things um, and feel safe, not judged, is, is the way forward um, and very powerful. I'm going to now um, talk about seven tasks of healing and therapeutic goals. And this comes from a book called Grief After Suicide by Jack Jordan. Um, he's been working in the area of supporting people after suicide and running groups for about 25 years. He's in the US. And um, he's written uh, quite a lot about this area. So I'm using, that's a book, 2011, that book came out. And um, so I'm basing um, quite a bit of this next part on um, uh, a chapter in um, this in that book that Jack edited. The first thing I'm going to focus on is the issue of trauma, and I certainly did touch on this last time, but just in a little bit more depth 
uh, today. So, um, I think the trauma can come from a number of uh, sources. So there's the the way that someone's died, and uh, many of the methods of suicide are violent and have implications for the person left behind. Um, I've got Rob Gordon written there, sensory and informational trauma. So the person who's found someone will have um, quite a bit of sensory experience, very direct experience of finding that person and seeing what they saw. And then also that someone who's not actually seen it, seen the person, um, will have what we call informational trauma. And certainly even um, the manner of someone's death, even when someone hasn't seen it, will still cause a level of trauma for those left behind. People will imagine it. They'll be wondering about it. How could they have done that to themselves? Um, so there'll be quite a bit of trauma um, with related to the way that they died, whether or not they saw what happened. Then there's the violation of the psychological and the physical space of the bereaved. So the psychological, and I've touched on this a few times really, is that sense of shattering the assumptive world. So it's like, I think I know who I am, who my family is, how our relationships are. And someone ending their own life can really just shatter uh, quite a few, I guess, assumptions we have about ourselves and the world. And that really, um, yeah, a suicide can just feel like an incredible assault on what we know. And so that's a sense of violation of the psychological world in a sense that we all have. And then there's the physical space. So many people, um, when they take their own lives, do die at home. And so, or nearby home. So that, again, as you, um, I'm sure you can imagine, has implications in terms of trauma, being at home, um, needing to avoid certain places. So some people will, um, will need to move out of their home because it's too traumatic, it's too triggering to actually be at home. So at home no longer feels safe. So quite a um, very difficult experience. And then there's the volition, just the fact that someone entered their own life. And I think I've probably said enough about that, um, but it's that impact of someone I love did this to themselves, ended their own life, took themselves away, and that just has um, particular consequences for people. So I think the thing to say about that too is that, well, doing the trauma work and psychoeducation is really helpful. Um, but I think it's also good to, norm, uh, to normalise the fact that people can become quite preoccupied um, over a long period of time with any of those things and um, that that is uh, normal. People can feel like they're going crazy with it. They don't want to think about it anymore, but it, it will be um, uh, a preoccupation for some time and people just need, you know, gentle guidance and assistance to deal with those things. The second um, aspect that Jack um, outlined in his uh, book was learning to dose grief and pain. So initially, um, this will feel and probably be quite impossible. Um, the grief tends to be overwhelming, relentless and all-consuming. It is all that um, anyone, um, that many people can think about, feel about. It's like it's the only thing. Uh, gradually over time, people certainly can learn to have control over when and when they don't um, have um, experiences of acute grief. Uh, so part of that is learning what brings relief and that's trial and error. And also what works for some situations won't work for others and over time what works will change. But it's encouraging people to find, um, sometimes it's about distraction, so it's finding things that, lead, that give some relief 
And then sometimes for other people, it's sort of moving towards the pain and allowing that expression of it, and then that settles. But it's it's that um, working out with people what works for them um, at particular times. People will get quite afraid sometimes, oh, I can't go back to work because I'm just going to cry. So you can assist people, for instance, to work out, well, what can they do at work? Um, is going back to work feasible at this point? And if it is, what can we, uh, how can we make this work? Um, so those sorts of things can be very helpful. And gradually people can get to a point where they can say, okay, so this is, this is my time for grief and I've allowed enough time for grief that when I'm in this situation, I won't be flooded with the grief. So that's quite an important um, aspect. Just um, and again, being gentle and patient is um, the way to go with this. The next thing um, is creation of a good enough story. So this is, in a sense, the answer to the why, why, why did this happen? How could this have happened? So, and um, Jack's called it creation of a good enough story. Um, there is a need to pursue, I think. Most people will have quite a strong need to pursue an understanding and they might go by, about that in a range of ways. Um, people often won't uh, feel settled. They will feel like they need to know what this person thinks about it or what that person thinks about it or what the doctor thought or their psychologist. So there can be quite um, a need to pursue information and understanding and that is not um, sometimes I think people think oh it's morbid they're obsessed with it it's it's okay uh, some people have a need to do it and some we call it sometimes a, a psychological autopsy so that's really reflecting on in a, in a counseling session or when you're speaking with someone it's reflecting on trying to understand what the state of mind of the person might have been. It's reflecting on what are the factors and what are all the factors that might have led this person to this point. And people will need to, to look at themselves. Did I do anything? Um, and that, that sort of level of guilt, which I will touch on uh, more, uh, but people will need to think about the last time they spoke to them. If the phone rang and they didn't pick it up, um, but their last conversation, so the last minutes, the last hours, the last days, the last weeks of a person's life will sometimes need um, sort of close examination by the bereaved. And that is, it's all okay. It's um, sometimes really important for people just to sort of keep digging for as long as they keep digging. And then they'll get to a point where they can learn to live with not fully knowing and not fully understanding, but that can be quite a process. I think one of the things that um, some people find difficult when being with uh, bereaved people, and this is whether we're a professional or even personally, is that there is a great need for repetition People will need to say, some people, not everybody actually, some people will need to speak repeatedly about certain things. So they're trying to integrate it. It is, I think, a process of integration. And it's, it's necessary for some people to be able to do that. Quite a few years ago now, I was um, had a, a client who was... Um, a young guy in his 20s, and he was intellectually disabled. He'd been living with his mother and uh, they were quite close. One day he found her deceased. He found her dead and she had taken her own life. So this was highly traumatic for him and, uh, you know, a terrible sort of thing. He... Not only uh, did he lose his mother, he lost where he was living. He needed to be in, um, he needed support where he was living. So that meant that he then moved into a group home. 
and he was traumatised. So what he did when he found his mother is he ran. He ran to the neighbours. He couldn't um, He couldn't call triple zero. It was uh, beyond him to do that. So in the work with him, um, we worked through all those, all those things over quite a long period of time. One of the things I learned uh, as a very valuable lesson um, working with him was that he was repetitive and part of that was to do with his intellectual disability. So there would be certain things that he would just simply like wrote, repeat. But what I, what I worked out was that when he was um, talking about his mother, his mother's death, finding her and what happened after, that each time he spoke about it, there would be a feeling or an emotion that was a bit different or a bit more intense. So there might have been anger or pain or fear. Um, there was an emotion that was either not there last time he told the story or was stronger this time. And the other thing I noticed was that there'd be a detail. Sometimes it's like, oh, I haven't heard that detail before. He didn't say that last time he was telling that story. So what, what I learned, a valuable lesson from this young man, was that when people appear to be repeating, often it's not a direct repetition. There is a little detail which is different and which you can then explore further. And that's part of that integration of what's happened. This is an aspect of this story that needs to be integrated. So um, um, uh, it's a very long time ago I saw him and I am every now and again very grateful that I met him um, because I learned quite a lot from working with him. Um, and he did need to move to a group home, but he was from a very, very loving family. Um, and so he was actually doing, doing quite well. The other thing that can really help in this pursuit of understanding why and coming to a good enough story is additional information. Sometimes friends of the person might know a little bit more about something. Sometimes there might be, um, sometimes things come to light after someone's died that can um, add to it. Um, it might not be known that perhaps there was um, an experience of sexual abuse in someone's early life. Sometimes people don't know that um, and then it comes to light after they've died. So these things can really um, help build that picture, build that story of how come uh, this person got to that point. So there might be information from uh, other people, but also um, sometimes access to documents can really help uh, in that. And so sometimes people will want access to maybe um, uh, the coronial file. And um, certainly we, we spend some time assisting people in accessing documents which can be um, helpful to them in understanding the state of mind of the person or some particular events uh, that happened before. Uh, yeah, so that's quite um, helpful. And the aim... Um, as it says there, is to create a complex, realistic and compassionate kind of narrative of how this person um, got to that point of ending their own life. So the complex part is where we're talking about um, there's, it's multiple factors that have contributed to this happening. So it's it's important that it's not just attributed to one thing because that's, it's never the case. It's always multiple factors. And so it's building that picture of all the things. Uh, like last time I talked about the perfect storm. So it's really taking into account all the factors. When it says they're realistic, it, it, um, it's really, um, again, looking at what has actually happened. So it's not having um, wishes or fantasies about it. It's really what's very real. Um, and so it's what, what's actually happened. And again, it's, it's that also being 
um, looking at one's own, not one's own role in the suicide, but that being able to, um, to see oneself in relationship to the person who died and look at that. Um, that's quite an important part of this. But also, even though we've got a role in someone's life, uh, we're not responsible or people are not responsible for the person's suicide. And I think that's quite a fine, finely tuned um, sort of nuance is that, um, and I'll, I was going to talk about this a little bit later, but we can have, people can have regrets about things that they said or did. That doesn't mean they caused this, this death. And I think that that over time, um, that's something that people are able to take in more and more. I have regrets. I wish I hadn't said this. I wish I hadn't made that decision when they were a child. But that didn't cause this to happen. And, uh, yeah, so that's, that's where in building a realistic story, that's part of that journey really of um, building that story. And also that it's a compassionate look at oneself at other people and also the person who's died. So it's having um, a deep understanding of being a human being and knowing that the person who's died, everyone around them, did the best that they could with the information that they had, what they knew. Um, yeah, so that's part of that building, I guess, a good enough story. And I think this can take quite a long time and will need to be revisited um, over and over. Sometimes people might have come to a bit of an understanding and then there's a bit of new information that comes in. So that needs to be revised. Another aspect is, um, and sometimes this is related to stigma, is learning to manage social connections. So uh, so the um, even relationships within a family and in a social network can be quite disrupted. There can be conflict. Um, and also the other thing I think that happens is that, the, that sometimes there's conflict. The other thing that can disrupt the relationships is that people don't know how to talk about it. It feels sort of almost unspeakable. So people don't know how to talk to each other about what's happened. They don't know how to put into words or, and how to speak about the person who's died. So there's a range of things that can really um, get in the way of people uh, being together and continuing their relationships and um, dealing with this together. And we also know, as I'm sure I would have said last time, that there is research evidence that people bereaved by suicide, and again, not everybody, but people bereaved by suicide are responded to differently um, than other forms of death. So people can be uh, left much more to themselves and feel quite isolated. So that's something that is real and does happen. And so... Um, it's good to be able to, I guess, um, work with people on that and also accept that it is actually true, unfortunately, uh, for many people. The other thing that can happen is what we sometimes call internalising stigma, where people feel shame at what's happened and then withdraw. So that can certainly happen. They'll be concerned about judgment of them also judgment of the person who's died. So that can certainly get in the way of relationships. So some of the tasks sometimes I think in, in uh, working with people is assisting them to deal with some of these difficult situations when they're about to go to a social occasion or when they're talking with people or bumping into people in the supermarket. How might they manage those relationships and those conversations? And certainly it's often part of the work with people is assisting them to um, answer questions or just manage situations. One of the things that can happen often is that it's sort of this, you know, bumping into someone in the supermarket saying they've died and then uh, 
people don't don't quite realise what they're doing, but they they start to ask intrusive questions. So how how to stop that, um, or how to respond, and also how to respond differently in different situations. So that it really is an important um, part of the work because people can then start to feel more confident um, and ready, in a sense, to connect with people. Um, yeah, so that's quite that's quite important. And I think a little bit aside to that is um, people will also sometimes need assistance in preparing, anticipating and preparing for particular like special occasions like birthdays, anniversaries, um, anniversary of the death. Those They can be quite difficult times for people. Lead up to the anniversary can be an in, acutely uh, difficult time and not only the first anniversary actually. So helping people prepare for those times is also an important part of um, preparing people for what they now face, in a sense, because of what's happened. So if, if you were here last time, you might remember that I talked about the idea of continuing bonds, where we've got this idea now that people in a sense can have a sense of uh, connection and uh, yeah, a sense of connection with someone who's died in whatever way um, they want to do that. What can happen with suicide is that people um, can feel um, rejected. It feels like a statement or a kind of, um, it feels like a statement about them. So they can feel rejected or abandoned because, you know, someone they love took their own life. It can feel like I'm being left, they left me, I wasn't good enough to stay for. Uh, so it can feel like a bit of a judgment of those who, who were left behind. So um, that then, so there can be quite a task then in, in repairing that, that uh, bond with the person who's died. One of the really, stark examples I had of that was when I was working with a woman and uh, she'd been married to her husband for around 40 years I think it was he took his own life and she came in very distressed one day because she really had a longing to go and visit his grave and she said to me but would he want me to and so we talked for quite a while about how the impact of his suicide meant that she felt rejected by him in his taking his own life. And um, she thought that perhaps he didn't love her and didn't want her to visit his grave. So that, again, it brings in the importance of of having a very complex and, in fact, quite um, expanded view of why people take their own lives. It isn't down to one person. And, in fact, I think many people take their own lives and it's actually got nothing to do with any particular person. It's got much more to do with their own state of being and their own sense of themselves and the value of their lives. So it does, um, it's very much related to that complex, realistic, compassionate idea of building, um, building a picture of how come this person took their own lives and taking everything into account. So that you can build a picture of the person um, and this, this person's relationship with the person who died, that really kind of disentangles from the fact that they took their own life. And the death then can be seen very much about the state of being of the person who died and isn't a comment on the person left behind. It isn't an abandonment or a rejection. It can certainly feel like that. But um, uh, it's incredibly rare, I think, uh, that someone's death by suicide is intended um, to make a, um, a statement to others left behind. Occasionally there can be, I think, um, 
a, a death by suicide that we might think of ha as having some vindictive quality. And mostly um, when I've come across that, it'll be in, in the context of family violence. Um, and even then, I don't think it's the only thing um, that's at play in the person, but certainly, um, uh, uh, certainly have come across situations where I think that's the case. But again, it's in the context of something like family violence. So it's not really to do with a kind of uh, the value of a, of a human being, if that makes sense. Sometimes um, some um, counsellors or support people find it very helpful to do some empty chair work and really that sense of communication with the person who's died. Um, yeah, so empty chair work. Some people find it very helpful with this aspect. Remembering the person who's died. One of the things we know about any grief is that when it's shared, when people can uh, be with one another, share stories, come to a shared understanding of what's happened, that that is actually very helpful. Social support is one of the most helpful things in, in grief. So having a supportive social network uh, is very helpful. And as I've said, sometimes that is disrupted with suicide. There can be um, conflict and not feeling able to speak about it that, that can really get in the way of building this um, or having this shared experience. And I've certainly met with, with clients who just feel bereft and so isolated because they've been sidelined by other people. Um, they've been blamed perhaps for what's happened so they've been sidelined so they're not even able to speak sometimes to anybody else who knew the person so that that's um, a very very difficult situation to be in uh, yeah so also the other thing that can happen is because of the level of pain and hurt uh, people can find it difficult to honour them and to find ways to really honour the person. I think often really the other thing that happens is sometimes people, after they've taken their own lives, their names just don't get mentioned anymore, so people don't speak about them. So it's as if they've kind of disappeared. And another aspect of that is that uh, sometimes people um, start to be defined in a sense, by the fact that they've taken their own life. So it's kind of, they get limited or reduced to um, the fact that they, they suicided. So um, we have a session in our eight week group, we call it Living Memories. And in that session, the participants bring along photos, mementos, and they tell stories um, about their loved one. And it's consistently in, in our um, feedback from the groups, that's the session that really uh, is incredibly memorable. It can be quite painful, but it's memorable in being able to speak about them and speak about who they were, how they lived, their accomplishments, their achievements, their qualities, their characteristics. And they don't, it doesn't all have to be, um, doesn't have to be rose covered glasses. People can talk about some of the issues and the problems, but it's a full picture of them um, and it acknowledges the love, the care, the humour, the all sorts of things um, uh, in the way people have lived. So that being able to really talk about that is really important. Hi, Louise. Helen here. Yep. Are you ready for some really tricky questions? Okay. <laughs> See how we go. Okay, they're great questions. Um, so there's two here and one of them is addressing issues where there's a note that's been left blaming other people for, yeah, for a suicide. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so um, it's good to be aware that um, most people don't leave a note. Uh, in fact, it's sort of 20 to 30% of people leave a note. 
uh, and most notes are expressions of regret, expressions of love, um, and yeah, apologies. And just or and sometimes they might talk about why, but actually sometimes they don't. And then um, occasionally, it's rare, but it does happen where the person leaves a note where they directly attribute the blame to someone. Um, might be a partner, might be a workplace. Um, yeah, all sorts of things can happen. Um, I guess it depends who who you're working with. If you're working with the person who has been directly blamed, um, then uh, it's what you're dealing with is also, in a sense, that um, sometimes that person will, as I said, be sidelined by other people then and held to blame, <clears throat> which is... Um, on top of the grief and trauma they're already experiencing, to then be ostracised uh, is intense and um, horrendous, really. Now, in working with someone like that, it's actually very similar um, to, to some of the things I've already said. It's very much about... Um, being empathic, certainly, with what's actually going on in their lives because of what's happened. Uh, and then it's also um, many people will be also blaming themselves. So when the letter and note says it's this person's fault, it's sort of that will just intensify someone's own feeling of guilt. So, again, you're just gently em empathising, but also um, you're working many people will have a very limited, simple view. It was this that did it. And what you're wanting to do is, as I've said in a later um, uh, slide, you zoom out. You keep bringing in different things that were going on. There was this. There was that. There was um, financial stress. There was issues with drugs and alcohol. There was uh, early trauma um, or, or you bring in everything and also um, and you might need to keep saying it. So I think it's it's those principles of not limiting um, the reason why someone's took their own life taken their own life. you don't limit it to this and you don't accept that it's true actually because it isn't. It isn't true that this person's to blame. yeah. I hope that's, yep, Helen, yep. Okay, I've got, uh, the next question is really interesting and quite topical at the moment, and that is talking about supporting someone when there was a family violence dynamic. Um, is there some special considerations? Do you have an example? Yes, yeah, definitely. Um Yes, there can be quite a number of layers of complexity. So um, what I'm thinking of here is when um, uh, a client that I'm seeing might be a woman whose um, husband um, takes his own life and there's been a history of family violence. So I saw um, a client... Um, I didn't start seeing her. She didn't come to see us until five years after her husband had died. So there was quite a lot, in a sense, that had gotten entrenched in terms of the impact. But some of the things that um, she was dealing with was um, what, what, what you're also dealing with is the history of trauma. So there's a history of being... Um, demeaned, degraded, and then also physical violence. So you, you're dealing with this grief and trauma in the context of a history of trauma. Um, also for her, and this won't be true for everybody, but for her, um, she was, it took her a long time to say this, she was glad he died. And um, 
and again, not even when it's family violence, not everybody will feel that way, but she did. And she had three children. So it was incredibly difficult for her. They'd lost their dad and they adored him. And so she, for her to assist her kids in their grief was very, very difficult. And um, so we worked quite a lot on that, how to, in fact, support her children grieving their dad when um, she basically hated him. And, yeah, so there's lots of layers of complexity. And, yeah, so you're dealing with the background of trauma, the sort of mismatch that there can be between kids and and um, and mum, and then also blame. Often then um, there can be blame on the woman who's uh, been abused because often the family, his family, won't know the extent to what's gone on and he may have lied to his family about what was going on. I've certainly seen more than one woman whose partner before um, he died had told his family that his wife was having an affair and it, it wasn't the case. So, therefore, when he takes his own life, uh, she's just already set up to be blamed. Um, I think that I think there might have been something else I was going to say about that, but I think yeah. So it is complex, um, and different um, variations of things can happen. But it is it's it's hard going. Uh, she said to me, Eve, um, she said to me, this is five years after. She said I didn't get off the couch for a year. So um, yeah, her family really struggled. And, and the abuse, the, the violence had been uh, emotional and physical and quite terrible. So, yeah, she had to deal with that. That was the other thing, is that she, she believed um, that he, he had probably planned um, to also uh, kill the children. So she was dealing with that as well. She had reason to believe that actually he'd planned that and didn't go through with it. So she had a, an immense amount of guilt that two weeks after they'd separated that she allowed the children to go to him. So um, she was plagued with remorse and guilt and a sense of responsibility that um, she'd put her children in that position where not only might they have been harmed, but they also found him. So, um, yeah, yeah. So I don't know if that's enough, but it's it can be very complex and um, so difficult because what a, a woman in that situation can find herself in is feeling very isolated because actually nobody really knows the full story. Only she does. Thanks, Louise. And um, just one final question, and then maybe we can have a, a little break. Mm -hmm. And um, you can have a have a break, and uh, we just have a little a pit stop. But yeah, um, sort of really, what you've just mentioned, and and you know the the extreme trauma and complexity of that situation really leads into the next question, which is about how to prevent secondary trauma to yourself when you're counselling people bereaved of, by suicide. I'm not sure if that meant, means that the, the counsellor has mm. already been through a suicide, uh, been bereaved themselves or not. Um, I don't know if um, that person would like to elaborate, but anyway, that is the question. Yeah. Um, I've not been bereaved myself. So in terms of that, um, that aspect of it, um, I can't comment but I think I mean when you're dealing with this level of grief and trauma um, then you know whatever you call it compassion fatigue vicarious traumatization is always going to be a possibility so uh, there's a number of things I think there's a number of levels to um, to of to avoiding or at, and preventing that um, and I think it's organisational at the basis of it. 
So it means that you work with an organisation that knows how to support. Like we've got a team of people um, and you work for an organisation that understands the level of the work and will allow us to do the work in the way we need to do it. So it's having a very supportive organisation, so nothing toxic. It's having a very good team, having very good colleagues, and, again, nothing toxic um, in the team. Uh, that's incredibly important. So knowing that people have got your back um, and uh, that you'll be supported and also that if you need to take a break, if you need to do, you know, not see this client or... So there's a lot of room and flexibility about the way the counsellors do the work. So there's that, that's in place. And then it's, it's supervision, it's very good self-care. Um, so it's at all levels, yeah. And so, yeah, and so it's people knowing when they're starting to get a bit tired or a bit irritable. But I think the best thing is that you have a sort of a culture where it's much less likely to occur, occur that you get burnout. So you're creating a culture where people are free to um, take time off if they need to. The other big thing I think is having a balanced life so that most people in the team work part-time, uh, not everybody but some, and also it's about having a full life outside so that it kind of balances it as well. So they're all the things that we sort of focus on uh, in the work so that it doesn't become um, problematic. Yeah. Thanks, Louise. Uh, okay. Uh, everybody, if we just take five minutes and um, then we'll reconvene. So grab yourself a cup of tea, go to the loo and we'll see you shortly.
Hi Louise, I think we should probably get started again. Um, yep. I've got, there is a couple of, there's one question here, but I'm going to save it to the end. Um, so okay. we uh, we get through your, you know, your presentation and then um, we've got a Q and A. So uh, the, any questions that are typed from now on, we'll save till the end, because we're almost there. Yeah, great. Thanks, Helen. Um, so. Uh, yeah, I think I've probably touched enough on that. That's certainly about um, a person not being defined by how how their life ended. And uh, restore functioning and reinvest in life, quite a task, which can be, again, um, a few years in the making for some people. So this is about uh, rebuilding reasons to go on living. It's... Many people will talk about how they, they know themselves to be more compassionate to people. They understand the suffering of others in a way that they didn't before. So there's that, I guess, what we think of as post-traumatic growth. Um, so it certainly can take a while. And it, it's involving making meaning out of the suicide, making peace with its reality. I think sometimes people think, oh, I have to accept it or... They'll be told by others, or oh, you need to accept what's happened. And for some people, it's never going to be acceptable. It's never going to be okay. But what people can get to is it has happened. I wish it hadn't. I wish I could have been able to stop it, but it actually has happened. And I think that's making peace with its reality and finding a renewed purpose um, for one's life. It's one of the reasons... Um, there's a number of reasons to have a volunteer program, but that's certainly one of them. For some people, they really feel um, that if they can help others, that that's making meaning um, and giving a sense of purpose to their lives. And I think it's also a change. Some people really change perspective on life. They change their priorities. Not everybody, but certainly that's part of this. Um, some people might change jobs but it is certainly about getting back to functioning again and also uh, what that might mean is having new a new sense of purpose developing new activities um, that really help with that just to focus uh, on guilt and blame which can be uh, persistent so there's, I think, different ways to have conversations with people about guilt and blame. One is to just say that guilt certainly is uh, almost unavoidable. It's completely... Um, most people um, will feel some sense of guilt, that they should have been able to stop it, they should have seen it. Um, and... I think one of the one of the ways to speak about guilt is that it is actually as a result of trauma. We want to be able to stop bad things happening. And I think it can feel very frightening when we realise that we can't stop some bad things happening. So feeling guilty means I can do something about it. So then it gives a sense of control. So that that's one of the things that's at work, I think, when people feel guilty is that actually um, if I'm responsible, then I can do something about it. So that, and again, that's a pretty widely um, known uh, response to trauma. Another way um, that I've learned to speak about guilt is in a sense that um, when we love someone, and um, you, it, you can most clearly see this when you're thinking about parents. I was talking to a mum yesterday. There's a sense of responsibility that comes with love. There's a sense of a bond that feels like there's a responsibility to care for, to look out for people that we love. And so when someone takes their own life, it feels like we have failed in that responsibility. 
So I think being able to frame guilt in a sense as a response, as a, as a response to love is helpful. Um, that of course, uh, we don't want this person uh, to have come to this point in their life and we want to be able to stop it. So that I think framing it in terms of love and responsibility, people can find very helpful. It's also, as I said uh, before, to zoom out from a limited view. So it's to add in all the factors that were at play and that were contributing to this person reaching that point. And another way that I um, have learned to talk about it too is in terms of regret and making a distinction between having regrets and feeling responsible. So people can have regrets about decisions they made, things that they've said. We can wish we'd acted differently in certain situations. But feeling guilty doesn't mean that we are guilty. And I think that's an important and quite nuanced um, way of thinking about it that can be very helpful. Feeling guilty doesn't mean we are guilty. We feel guilty for a range of reasons because we love someone, because we wanted something different for them in their lives. Um, and related to that, Jack Jordan talks about a fair trial. So it's, um, it's another way of framing uh, this sort of intense guilt is that um, it's a bit like um, you're, you're working for the prosecution at all times and let's have a defence lawyer in there as well. So, again, that's part of, it's a way of looking at all the factors. And we've got a, um, a handout that's called A Fair Trial, um, which I can um, send around. Uh, but there's some of the ways that I've learned to speak about guilt with people. And, um, and at different times, I might choose a different way of speaking about it that helps people um, not to be so zoned in, you know, not be so focused on their own sense of responsibility, but actually learn to see it in a larger sort of context. Um, I heard a dad, bereaved dad talk a few years ago, and he was speaking 10 years um, after his son's suicide. And he said that, you know, like the guilt initially was just as big as the, the universe. And he said, it had come down to this big and he said he always he thought that he would always have that because he was his dad um, and there's that sense of um, protection and responsibility that comes with being being a dad that he thought he was always going to have that little bit yeah okay so now we're going to move just briefly I we get asked a lot about um talking to children, and that's the bit I'm going to focus on most just for a little while. People often ask, is it okay to tell the children? Some people have got an idea that you shouldn't tell children what's happened. Um, and so uh, we've certainly developed, a, I guess, a position and a recommendation about that. Just in terms of supporting children, um, it's good. One of the main things I think is safety and security and trust. They're the things like surrounding um, people, uh, surrounding children with, uh, with people who care about them and who'll be stable and who'll listen, who'll be honest. And also I think it involves really informing the school and working with the school on, um, on how, on returning a child to school or also how things work at school. So there's some of the things that are important. Very often, if it's a parent who's died, the surviving parent, um, or even if it's a child who's died, surviving parents will be quite debilitated themselves and be not so available to their other children. So that's when bringing in other um, adults, sort of other scaffolding around a child can be really important. And then there's the issue of, telling children and I'm just going to we've got a booklet called tell me what happened which goes into this in a lot of detail and the reasons why it's good to tell children is that they will very often 
pick up that something is wrong and then there's anxiety and mistrust. Um, they will um, make things up if they're not told what's going on. And the other concern is that others may tell them inappropriately or there might be half-truths. So it's important that a, a parent or a trusted adult um, is able to speak with kids uh, and it re very much is about trust. We've certainly talked to kids who weren't told and it feels like quite a breach of trust. So this is our little book and um, as Ben says there, half the booklet is from children and young people and their parents speaking about these conversations. So even if it's the worst thing, I'd rather know the truth. It's very important for building trust. So in the booklet, we go through um, the steps of telling children how to do that, some of the words to use, body stops working, someone makes their own body stop working. Um, I won't spend too much time on this because it is in the booklet and I'm certainly happy to send a link around. We have it available online. Um, and to answer honestly, one of the things that people also really balk at is even if a child, some children will want to know how the person died and some children won't. Um, so we do recommend that people, that children are told in an age appropriate way and certainly not, not graphic. They don't need to be um, told anything more, um, just the basics. And they may need to be told repeatedly that they're not responsible. Children will easily see themselves as responsible and they can link things like if a child didn't do their homework and then the next day dad dies, they can link the two things. So helping them with that can be really important. Okay. I'll stop sharing screen now. Helen, is there anything, is there, are there any questions or? Um, oh, people... Louise, okay, yeah. yes, yes, thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. Your, um, your knowledge is, um, you know, so deep and, and so broad and, and we really appreciate your expertise on this. And I do have a question here, which um, is about how, how can you support someone who lives in a different country from where the suicide has occurred? How would you support them to be able to manage? Yes, um, certainly. Yeah, look, we've, we've had clients where, you know, they live in uh, Victoria, but the person died overseas. The, some of it is the same, but it's also... Um, there's two aspects to it I think one is is that it will be hard for it to feel real so um, there's a sense that it'll feel um, not quite real and I think so working with that being able to acknowledge that and get a sense of that for people and um, the other thing is that Again, like um, you, you, you may, um, you may, for instance, get the coroner in Victoria, if the person's living in Victoria, to get in touch with whoever's handling, you know, whatever the equivalent of a coronial service is in another country. So getting them to maybe access documents and things like that. I think those things can be helpful and you can definitely do those things. Um, sometimes you'll get the documents in another language. So then they need to be translated but um, doing those things can be helpful. But it is, it's um, sort of working with that sense of unreality. Mm, yeah, thank you, Louise. Um, um, just a comment here uh, about what your thoughts were. Uh, I'm not sure if you're aware of the, the TikTok video that came out and it, I think it originated from America, it was, a video of someone who 
had completed suicide, I think. Yes. Anyway, the, there was advice given out to um, not to warn or talk to children about the video. And um, what, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, yeah. I think th I, I thought there was advice not to watch it. Like, don't watch it. And what it did was that it sort of meant that it was, um, I think people were encouraging um, yeah, so someone's just said many of our students saw it. Yeah, um, it's very disturbing. My understanding is that it was video of someone who ended their life. So it was a terrible thing to be available. So it's, it has happened on Facebook before. Um, and the sort of warning went out through all the media um, to keep children and young people, well, keep it everybody everybody away from TikTok and not to watch it it's like I just think it's incredibly difficult like of course people it's I don't think people should watch it it's just awful the thought of that um because it's traumatic and you just don't know what effect it's going to have um so but warning people publish it publicizes it and then people get curious I do and so I, I think it's a it's one of those no wins. I do think though mm. that there is a responsibility to say this is the sort of thing that can happen, and um, there was an emphasis on children and young people not watching it. But I would have thought nobody nobody needs to watch that. So I don't have an answer for it. It's one of those tricky things that comes up because of social media and the accessibility. Um, uh is an issue on social media yeah mm. yeah yeah i think it became if you ban something it becomes it becomes much more appealing to young people yeah and i i think that was what the warning with around not to talk to them about it was was really trying to point out i think um particularly around teenagers about you know if you if you really go over the top and, and warn them and warn them, then it sort of becomes more appealing at the end yes. of the day. Yes, yeah, and that's right. Yeah. That's right, it does. It creates then people, the young, well, young people in particular, will get an urge to watch it and see what it is and then it's too late. You know, it's that thing you can't unsee it. Um, yeah, and some things are best not. We don't need to see them. Mm. Yeah, that's a really tricky situation, wasn't it? It is, yeah, yeah. Mm. And then I think if nobody gives a warning, then it's like, well, actually some parents would have wanted the warning and don't watch social media for a few days, which is a really big ask, I think, for young people. Wouldn't trouble me at all, but <laughs> but um, for young people, it's the sort of lifeline, really. Mm. Okay, thank you. And a uh, question here, it sounds like long-term counselling is really what is needed. Um, how is this funded? How can we help if our role is very short-term? Yeah. Um, for some people, yeah, not everybody does require long-term counselling, but some people really do benefit from it. Um, and I think it is the way it is needed for um, a certain group of people. Um, I think if you're, um, if you're limited in the number of sessions or the number of times you can meet with someone, then, I mean, you would already be doing all these things, just being very clear about what you can do. And I guess making, and I'm sure you already know this, but just working out what is possible in the time and what's most necessary to do and then um, you might well be able to refer them to us. Um, the other thing to do is link them in with a group if there's one available, yeah. Mm. It's one of those things, again, there's no easy answers to that, yeah. I think the other thing is that, um, like, it is, it's, it's, it's unfortunate when someone who's bereaved by suicide has made a link with a counsellor and then needs to change. When, you, when, you've, when you're the one who's been there at the beginning and seen them in those first few sessions, it, it is hard to change counsellors. 
Um, so I'll just say that as well. And there's no easy answers to that either if you're in the position of um, having a limited number of sessions. Mm. Yeah. Thanks, Louise. I have another question about letters being written. Mm -hmm. um, if the letters have been left and the person, the brief person has possession of the letters, just suggestions around how to discuss the, the, uh, the, the letter. Oh, gosh, there's been different things. Mostly notes sh should theoretically go to the coroner. So all the, all the coroner should have probably the original, usually they have the originals. And then you, if, if you, the bereaved person, have got a letter addressed to you, then you might need to apply to the coroner to get a copy. Um, sometimes people can be really scared about what's in the letter. So I've had certainly clients who've said, you read the letter and tell me what's in it because um, people are terrified that they are going to be blamed. So that's I've certainly done that with families where um, you read the letter and then, and then what I'll do is ask, what is it that you're wanting to know? So it's like just going slowly about it. What is it that you're wanting to know or what is it that you're concerned about? And um, then I will answer those questions and I would answer um truthfully thankfully um, when I've been in that situation um, I didn't need to break any you know there was no blame it was more talking about why or, or what had happened but it's um, sometimes that is the way to go about it you you read it first ask them what it is they want to know or they're concerned about and then you respond um, and then, again, you'd be using some of the principles we've already talked about. It's like if someone is being blamed, sometimes, I mean, a letter, a, a note doesn't necessarily have an answer. Sometimes it, people just feel like it makes more questions. But it can give you an insight into their state of mind. You know, how confused is their thinking? Um, what, what are they talking about? So all those things can give you a bit of insight into how the state of mind of the person and the things that were on their mind. Um, so you can you can work through that. And I think the other thing, this, there's a bit of a cliche around suicide, which is that, you know, the answer goes with the person. But actually, I, th I think sometimes people who are in their own lives actually don't even really know why. They just know they feel terrible and they want it to stop. So I think... Um, people's idea that a note is going to answer questions. Um, it can give you a picture of their state of mind, maybe sometimes what was on their mind. But as I said, often it raises more questions than it answers. And often it seems like if they put the reasons in, it's like the reasons don't feel good enough. It's like you didn't have to take your own life for that reason. Yeah. So it, it's, yeah, it depends. Yeah. Great answer. So there are more questions, however we are over time. We still have quite a number of people online. Um, so we can keep going, but uh, the, the session was due to finish at 11.30. So please uh, people feel free to, um, to stay on board for the maybe one or two more questions, Louise, is that? Yeah, I do, I do have yeah. time. You do have time, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the session is over. So obviously people will be leaving. Um, so, sorry, this one's really long. I just need to have a sec to read it. Right. Okay. Oh, look, I, look, we've had a few things come up around supporting people who I guess have a loved one that ha may have attempted a number of times um, suicide or have their situations around their life which makes it, them in a, in a high risk category like someone who has uh, drug and alcohol um, issues, uh, mental health, whatever. So I, I guess people are looking for a little bit of guidance in terms of that. In terms of the person who died or in the person that you might be seeing? Uh, okay. 
Okay, let me see. Talking to families, the, there's no one thing that results in a little impact. So it's around dealing with their fear and anxiety that that person may one day, you know, um, die. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, I mean, that is different to bereavement. It's just, mm -hmm. it's been mentioned a couple of times. Yeah. I don't know if you it have It is any also thoughts. relevant in, 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 in bereavement because um, sometimes you'll be seeing someone and there's some, someone has entered their life and actually there's someone else in the family who's vulnerable and who's in one of those high risk groups um yeah to do with mental health or to do with drug and alcohol or or their life may be sort of chaotic in a range of ways and um so either way it is um it's a hard position to be in in life um I think that um, one of the things to do is to make sure um, people are informed, that they know um, about, because the person that they're concerned about might be getting help or they might not be. And then it's just heartache, you know, either way sometimes. But it is helping them be informed about suicide uh, and the risk of suicide, and also to know what to do if they feel like the the risk is high or imminent, as we sometimes speak about it, so that they know what to do. Um, it depends on the circumstances. We've certainly had clients where, in a sense, um, we have thought that there would be another death and. Uh, someone who we weren't seeing, but another family member, and that has happened. So, um, again, you know, tragedy after tragedy. But working with the person who's anxious is assisting them to be informed, knowledgeable, to, to have so that they're informed about what's going on, but also what's, what sources of help might be available, how to talk to the person, um, and how to maybe maximise the chance, if possible, that they'll seek help. So it's all those sorts of conversations. And then it's assisting the person to deal with their anxiety and um, to really talk through some of those things. Yeah, it's, um, we have certainly been in that situation and it's um, mm. sometimes, uh, it, most often it works out well and sometimes it doesn't. So um yeah it's hard painful okay thanks louise um there was is one more question that is a fairly broad and it's just thoughts and suggestions around cultural aspects to suicide within a family and i know that can mean a lot of things to a lot of different families and and different people so um we'll take this as the last question and just um let you give us some some thoughts on that Yes, so it is broad. Um, so there can and there can be different things. Sometimes what you, I mean, I'm sure you kind of all know this already, but you're dealing with um, generational issues when you've got different. You know, you've got um, people, newly arrived people, um, and you. I think one of the biggest things I've seen is generational issues where an older generation might be more linked with the culture from a. You know, when you're talking about ethnicity. The country that they've come from and the children um, are more linked to um, Australian culture. So that can cause issues and what you're always trying to do is facilitate communication and really see it from both points of view. Um, you know some cultures you know that we've actually worked with in the past few years don't have um, any kind of um, language for mental health or even suicide, whereas the younger generation will. And so again, it's just deeply trying to understand both points of view and facilitate communication if you can. I think one of the things I've really learned in the last little while um, is that what you want to be doing sometimes is working with workers who are from that group. 
and uh, so that um, uh, fortunately we've been able to do that uh, in one of the African communities where what we've done and others, not just us, have worked with workers from that community who've then provided the support because they've got that deeper understanding. Mm. Um, I think the other um, issue, I don't know if this was the intention, but where you're dealing with someone who might have been LGBT uh, QA plus who's died um, and uh, that sometimes um, there can again be issues and complexities in a family if that is um, not recognised by a family then that can have implications for friends of the person who's died um, so assisting um, maybe we might be dealing with friends or partners of someone who's died who might have been excluded from the funeral, um, and that can happen not just in the LGBT community, but people might have been excluded from arrangements because they've been blamed or the family doesn't want to acknowledge them. So assisting a person in that situation to um, um, sometimes actually come up with their own rituals, and that certainly happens. Sometimes there'll be... Um, someone a couple of years ago uh, took her own life and um, the queer community actually arranged a whole you know set of functions and events around that because the funeral was not in keeping with the really with the identity of this young person who died so it's being um, very adaptable really to who you're with and really seeing things from their point of view which I'm sure is something you do anyway. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Louise. That is just a wonderful way to end today's session. Um, so yeah, I hope everyone got a lot out of it. I certainly did. I always do whenever I hear Louise speak. And um, yeah, uh, we'll be sending out an evaluation survey to all the participants and the recording of today, the presentation and a certificate. So thanks everyone for attending and um, enjoy the rest of your day. Okay, bye.